the pools have all been found. All of them. What are you talking about? Yes. No, they haven't. Yes. It's called drainage, DeFi. See, I own all the liquidity, so of course, I get all the yield. I drink your yield. I drink it up every day, and then I dump it every day. No, VC, come on. I need a friend. I gotta have this. Our community is deserting us. You are not the chosen one. Do you understand? The liquidity has been rugged. There's nothing you can do about it. It's gone. It's rugged. You lose. Drainage! Drainage defy you, boy! It's all gone. I'm so sorry. If, if you have a milkshake, I have a milkshake, and I have a straw. Here it is. It's a straw. Are you watching? And my straw reaches across the room and starts to drink your milkshake. I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. Don't bully me, VC. Did you think your community and your high APY and your cheap tokens would save you? I am the one on the cover of Forbes magazine. I am the one Satoshi has chosen. Spend any time in DeFi over the last year and a half, and that is what it has felt like to be a DeFi protocol. But now, something is changing, a new movement. They're calling it DeFi 2.0, staring the VCs coldly in the eye and munching on a horrible carrot. This is the Defiant. Okay, so you want to know what the SBF is up with this DeFi 2.0 bizzo. Well, you've come to the right place. What is DeFi 2.0? Well, you can do yourself a favor and avoid having to watch the rest of this video and make yourself look cool at your next DeFi mixer with this simple explanation. DeFi 2.0 is a meme. End of story. But of course, it isn't. The key to understanding it is, in fact, orientating yourself around the concept of liquidity in DeFi. Where it is, who's supplying it, and how likely it is that they're going to keep supplying it. Liquidity is the spine running through DeFi. DeFi 2.0 simply recognizes that a stronger spine, better supported on all sides, is better for the long-term health of everything. And when you think of the composability of money Legos, how all the pieces connect one to another across all the different protocols, and now increasingly across chains, this metaphor of a physical body isn't so far-fetched. So, in this episode, we will run through some of the protocols leading the way here. Olympus DAO, Tokamak, Bancor, and Ichi, to see if we can understand what all the fuss is about. But first, a quick word from our sponsors. Don't let high gas costs keep you out of Ethereum. A balancer, the gas-optimized vault architecture makes trading cheaper than anywhere else. Liquidity providers can optimize their fee earnings using the dynamic fee system that automatically adjusts to market conditions. You can also use asset managers to lend out idle assets, dramatically increasing your capital efficiency. And because Balancer is an open platform for flexible automated markets, you can choose from stable pools or weighted pools. And in the future, more designs will be created that we don't even know about yet. Check it out at Balancer. Do you want to get actionable insights and find new investment opportunities before everyone else? Well, Nansen is a blockchain analytics platform tracking more than 100 million wallet addresses. Make informed decisions on your yield farming and investments through dashboards like Hot Contracts, Smart Money, and NFT Paradise, and see who's aped into an NFT collection or farm, and look into the behavior of money flows on chain. Sign up now at nansen.ai and become a smarter investor today.
DeFi Saver is one of the essential DeFi apps for advanced portfolio management with tools to instantly leverage up or unwind your positions. Available for top Ethereum lending protocols such as MakerDAO, Other, Liquity, Compound, and Reflexer. Famous for its flagship automation features, DeFi Saver is known for saving hundreds of positions from liquidation during major market crashes, such as the one we had in May 2021. By constantly monitoring your positions and automatically making adjustments as soon as needed, it provides you with peace of mind while being away from your keyboard and your keys. DeFi Saver also enables you to combine various DeFi actions, create unique protocol interactions, and execute them in a single transaction using their recipe creator feature. DeFi Saver is your one-stop dashboard for creating, managing, and tracking your DeFi positions. Necessity, as they say, is the mother of invention. And while DeFi 2.0 might not be well, the right name for what's going on, the reason it's even become a thing is because there are some very real problems that need solving. Firstly, mercenary liquidity mining creating a negative feedback loop for protocols. As Scoopy Truples founder Alchemix told The Defiant, profit taking is expected, but when a giant player comes in and exclusively dumps the governance token, it creates a dynamic where all price appreciation is nullified. This depresses the community and convinces them to do the same, or else they won't ever be able to realize their gains. Scoopy was actually kind of coy when pressed on who he might be referring to here, but if you do a bit of digging, one name surfaces repeatedly with allegations of merciless dumping, and that name, Alameda. But you know, it might just as easily be any number of VCs who are exploiting farming opportunities at the expense of a protocol's long-term health. DeFi relies on participants supplying liquidity. Everyone should be familiar with LPing now and assuming the risk of impermanent loss. Now, if a protocol enjoys market success and causes price appreciation in its native tokens, LPs pay the price in impermanent loss. Now, apes, well, they don't care because they only farm pools with monster APYs hoping to outrun the IL and withdraw before it all collapses. But this setup, well, fun for those who like to gamble or for YouTubers who need to feed the algorithm. The game theory is misaligned, and this disincentivizes long-term LPs, even if they are in fact long-term believers in the protocol. And that's basically it. DeFi 2.0's goal is simply to stiffen up liquidity, reduce sell pressure on native tokens, and flip a negative feedback loop into a positive one. Now, as we well know, crypto is prone to savage market crashes, and when they occur, Liquidity providers tend to quite rationally yank their liquidity from pools to protect their capital. The thing is though, it's precisely at these moments that the protocol needs liquidity the most. So before we look at the new, let's take a moment to go back and look at the old, or rather to the now, if you like. One of the biggest hurdles DeFi protocols face is how to attract enough liquidity to make their protocols' functions behave properly. The bootstrapping or zero to one phase is critical. Now, most projects allocate a sizable percentage of their native tokens as liquidity mining incentives. After all, it's pretty easy to magic tokens out of thin air when you launch. Compound was the first properly electric yield farm and the one that ignited DeFi Summer 2020. The governance token comp was launched and then distributed for free to anyone who used the compound lending and borrowing services. Suddenly, TVL, total value locked, was the metric du jour. Apes became a thing and DeFi hit the big time. But in the middle of all this noise and perceived success, it was actually very difficult to tell who was using Compound for its protocol strength, lending and borrowing, and who was just a mercenary yield pillager. The hold comp in the months following the launch. It was basically far preferable to dump the token than to hold it. When comp launched, it was really the only game in town. But within weeks, the whole space had become a kind of buyer's market with yield farmers offered an endless buffet of farming opportunities. So they buggered off as soon as the going got tough and never looked back. That initial rush pump phase does send a signal to the market that there might be something interesting here and projects looking to make a splash lean into that narrative by promoting incentives to quote unquote VCs and quote unquote 
hedge funds to get their fat stacks into fat farms and fatten the goose till its guts burst and the whole thing collapses. And it's at this point that the slower farmers get wrecked, and those who actually do believe in the project, well, they also get wrecked, even if only temporarily. Sentiment plays like this enormously outsized role in the perceived success or failure of a project, and pretty much all sentiment revolves around price action. Just spend time in any Discord channel and you will see it. When moon, why dumping, etc., etc. Now, you can add vesting to incentives programs, but really this is just delaying the inevitable. When shown a door, liquidity will exit because it can, and a protocol is powerless to do anything about this. Liquidity providers are not under contract. The protocol must simply hope that they can create positive enough conditions for them to remain. But all of this operates from an assumption that protocols must always rent liquidity. But here's an idea. What if they didn't? What if they actually owned it? What would that look like? And is it even possible? So I first became aware of POL, Protocol Owned Liquidity as it's now known, when Alchemix gave notice that they would be shifting from a model of majority farmed liquidity mining to one built using bonds. And this particular adventure coincided with the rise of one particularly memeable protocol who had built their entire project around trying to solve this problem for themselves. Olympus DAO, famous for the three three meme is designed to function as a decentralized reserve currency. It's not a stable coin, but it's rather a pegged asset where the base value of the native token Ohm is $1 and can't really fall beneath that, but it's free to rise in value as the market sees fit. Users of Olympus can either stake their existing Ohm tokens and receive new Ohm from rebased rewards or supply other assets in exchange for discounted Ohm. These are bonds, and it's how the protocol has been able to take ownership of its own liquidity. So here's how it works. Olympus sells its own token, OM, at a discount to the market value in exchange for other assets. That discounted OM is then vested over a period of a few days, usually five, and at the moment, the protocol supports the bonding of two asset types. They'll take LP tokens that represent liquidity added to decentralized exchanges like SushiSwap, and single assets such as DAI, FRAX, Rapteeth, or LUSD. When users exchange LP tokens for discounted OM tokens, the LP tokens transfer to the protocol itself. So here, Olympus is acquiring LP tokens that represent the most common OM pairs such as Ohm Dai, Ohm Wrap Teeth, Ohm Frax, or Ohm LUSD. And this means Olympus, yes, owns its liquidity. So at the moment, Olympus currently owns over 99% of its own liquidity in the shape of assets, which are, let's not forget, also productive. In less than six months, Olympus claim to have generated over $3 million in swap fees. Not bad. And this being DeFi, where everything is transparent, we can find their treasury contract, which is the vault holding all the funds collected by the protocol right here. Near enough, $709 million, which is very, very close to the TVL of Polygon's quick swap decks. The difference being, ain't nobody gonna run away with that liquidity, it's theirs. Now, after six months of data collection, Olympus realized that their bond mechanism, well, it actually worked, and they could package it as a service to other protocols, bringing even more value to the Ohm token in the process, because they're putting pairs together with Ohm, so Ohm ALCX, for instance. That was the birth of Olympus Pro. Alchemix signed up, as did Barnbridge, Pandal, and many more. There is now a dedicated marketplace for selling bonds, and investors like you and me will be able to use this marketplace to buy tokens of different protocols at a discount in exchange for other assets that can then become a part of the protocol's treasuries. Diversification, all right? Version two of Olympus actually went live in mid-October and had a major overhaul for the mechanics of redeeming bonds, but the principle of poll, well, it remains the same. 
Now, another protocol we've covered here on the channel is Tokamak, which aims to create sustainable liquidity by creating a kind of decentralized market-making protocol. And in Tokamak, individual assets benefit from their own pool, called a reactor, where the protocol token, TOKE, is used for directing liquidity to where it's needed. Liquidity providers supply only one token to a dedicated reactor, and then TOKE holders become liquidity directors who decide where the liquidity should flow. But you can watch our unboxing video on Tokamak here to dive deeper into how all of that works. But let's turn our attention back to another of those pesky liquidity provision headaches and permanent loss. Because, yes, the Olympus Pro model might create POL, protocol-owned liquidity for protocols, but it also means they're on the hook for the associated impermanent loss. We dug into Bancor version 2 recently, specifically looking at how they mitigate impermanent loss for LPs, and they provided some kind of startling numbers in a survey that suggested around 50% of users staking their tokens in Uniswap v3 are actually suffering negative returns due to impermanent loss. Bancor's solution is to offer a kind of insurance against IL that means whatever you enter a bank or LP position with, you're guaranteed to leave with alongside the earned swap fees. Now, it takes 100 days for this coverage to fully mature to 100%, but protocols will naturally be working off longer timelines, so this shouldn't represent too much of an issue. And if you want to know how badly you've been wrecked by impermanent loss, there's a handy website to give you the goodies. Remember, kids, always practice safe decks. But that was Bancor version 2. And I was so slow getting to this one, we are in fact ready for Bancor version 3, which Twitter user ZeroXChaos is now helpfully calling DeFi 3.0. Wait, are we not still in DeFi 2.0? No, no, well, no, yes. So there was one thing we didn't cover in the recent video, was the Vortex Burner, which is Bancor's own POL mechanism, which basically you lock up BNT via VBNT with the protocol actively burning that VBNT using a percentage of fees earned from swaps. Got it? So think of it this way. Imagine a $100,000 trade is executed on a pool with a 0.2% fee. $200 is then collected by liquidity providers. 5% of that fee, which is about $10, then buys VBNT and burns it. The trick here is that VBNT is a token issued to anyone that stakes BNT, allowing them to realize liquidity on those staked positions and then go hunting for better opportunities without losing the rights to the underlying position and its associated swap fees. Now, you can only withdraw BNT from the staking contract by supplying an equal amount of VBNT. So, if VBNT is being burned, then the associated BNT is now locked forever. It can still be used to facilitate swaps, but it can't be taken out of the protocol. So by using profits to acquire VBNT from the open market and using that to lock BNT into the system forever, Bancor has created a sustainable mechanism for creating an up-only liquidity pool. But wait, there's more. I was so late to the party covering Bancor V2 that V3 is already upon us, dropping on the 29th of November, but we still only have a few snippets to work off. However, here are some juicy morsels to look forward to. First off, LP positions will be once again represented by tokens, which opens up composability and third-party integration. You won't have to wait 100 days for full impermanent loss coverage anymore. It'll be much lighter on gas costs, and the protocol's locked BNT, which is just sitting there, will no longer be an idle asset, but available to go to work for the protocol. Now, we will indeed cover V3 in more detail when it's released, and it'll be interesting to see if long-term Uniswap liquidity providers begin to move over in search of a better deal. So finally, earlier this week, we covered Ichi and their novel approach to balancing a protocol's need for liquidity to cover operating expenses and a community's desire to see tokens preserve their value 
by issuing community branded dollars. Now these pseudo stablecoins commit native currencies and USD into a smart contract that creates a decentralized monetary authority allowing them to fund activities. The community governs this branded dollar and it ensures that native currencies are not sold in the open market but retained by the community. So you're effectively taking the scarce native token and ring fencing it and saying this is valuable and we want to keep it, we don't want to sell it. Instead, we'll use these branded dollars. Now like Bancor, Ichi is also aiming to improve on the Uniswap experience and has just launched Angel Vault. Now this is a new UniV3 liquidity management protocol that allows LPs to deposit single-sided assets into a UniV3 pool. And it's creative for projects to build a treasury of project-owned liquidity, POL, and everyday DeFi users to earn fees without needing to manage their pool positions. It's a little bit like Visor, but with some added superpowers. So liquidity provider positions in Uniswap are represented by NFTs because they have to represent you know, a unique price range for two specific assets. And because of this, it kind of makes it impossible to use them in existing liquidity rewards contracts. Ichi claims that Angel Vault solved this with three headline features which work in tandem with their existing branded dollar products. So this is buy liquidity, non-inflationary rewards, and protocol-owned liquidity. So let's look at the first one, the buy liquidity. The Angel Vaults create concentrated buy-side liquidity pools using buy-side liquidity strategies to ensure that there is always liquidity of the deposited token under the price of the other asset in the Uniswap V3 pool. And as the price of the assets change, the strategy rebalances the pool to put more buy-side pressure on the other asset. So what does that look like exactly? Well, a one uni angel vault, that one uni being the branded dollar that represents Uniswap, creates a position in a Uniswap V3 pool that has the one uni and Ichi pair. The angel vault receives only one uni branded dollars from LPs and returns an ERC20 LP token. And then it uses that to provide buy limit orders, holding one uni liquidity under the current price range on Ichi within the pool. As the price of the Ichi fluctuates, the Angel Vault itself rebalances, ensuring it remains concentrated on the buy side of the token. And you get an LP ERC20 token, not an NFT which you can do whatever you want with. Now let's look at non-inflationary rewards. So by creating branded dollars through Ichi and then establishing an angel vault with that branded dollar, crypto projects can actually offset the cost of liquidity rewards. And this is done due to the upward price pressure created from locking the community's own scarce token when minting its branded dollar and then using it as the single asset deposited in the Angel Vault. So by locking up a community's native token, it's off the market, but it can then be used to provide liquidity into a pool. Very interesting indeed. Protocol-owned liquidity is the third piece of this. So here's where the Angel Vaults work with branded dollars to convert total value locked, TVL, into assets under management. So when branded dollars are minted, scarce crypto is locked into the treasury that is governed by the protocol and its users. Then what you do is you incentivize liquidity providers to stake their Vault LP tokens, and that inherently incentivizes those users to mint or purchase branded dollars, which converts the scarce crypto used to mint into assets governed by the project itself, and bingo, you have protocol owned liquidity. Now I appreciate all of this sounds extremely complicated. So I would prefer you to go directly to the protocol owners and founders themselves to discuss how that actually works for the specific needs of your protocol. But safe to say, it's pretty ingenious. Now, <clears throat> like many, I was skeptical that DeFi 2.0 was really a thing. And I come away from all this homework convinced that it really isn't a brand new version of DeFi at all. The truth is liquidity mining is always going to be a necessary component of bootstrapping a young protocol, but the difference is now, that protocol will be able to plan for a transition to a majority POL setup. 
And it seems clear now that there are a number of different ways to achieve this that can be tailored to each protocol's needs. You could use Ichi, you could use... <laughs> Forgotten the names of the... F and it's not just protocols. NFT communities could also move to this model, particularly ones where the assets generate their own token. So really we should consider this like a firmware update for liquidity. But however you meme it, for those that understand how to position themselves, there are now proven sustainable ways to decouple from the mercenary farming machine. Staring the VC squarely in the eye and saying, no thank you sir, this was the defiant. Thank you.